Thanks. Um, I'm just going to get started here. Uh, about the, almost a year ago, last March, um, my wife and I and um, 12 other people went on an excursion to Borneo. Um, it's a, a small group of people that were part of a National Geographic tour, and uh, I'll go through that right now, but most of you probably are a little fuzzy on where Borneo actually is, so I'm going to start with that. Borneo is uh, this island right here. It's the third largest island in the world, uh, Greenland being the first, the largest island. Uh, the next largest island here is this one here, Papua New Guinea. Um, and then, so this is the third largest island in the world. It's about the size of Pennsylvania and New York together. Uh, so it's a fairly sizable island. It actually has three countries on it. Um, Kalimantan is part of Indonesia. Uh, Sarawak and Sabah are part of Malaysia. And then the independent country of Brunei is also on this island. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this, but it has a long history. Um, it was active in trade in the 6th century, uh, largely with Chinese and Indian merchants. Um, somewhere it became an independent country in the 14th century, uh, although most of what was passed as a country then was just sort of the coastal towns. The inland was occupied um, by uh, natives uh, that were largely independent um, of, of any, any other kind of thing going on. Um, the uh, British and Dutch started trading and colonizing, making these colonies in the uh, 14th, 15th, and 16th century. And so after various adventurous people and disputes and travel from other places, they settled into uh, the, the Dutch occupying uh, Kalimantan, the, the lower part of, which is now part of Indonesia, and then the British occupying uh, the two provinces uh, on the northern part of, of Borneo. Uh, pretty much remained that um, for a century and a half until it was occupied by the Japanese during World War II. Um, the Australians freed Borneo from uh, Japan um, and uh, right away Sukarno uh, Sukarno was imprisoned by the Dutch and set free by the Japanese, and Sukarno worked with the Japanese to, to, make, to, to make that part of Borneo a separate, separate country. So right after it was freed by the Australians, Sukarno declared independence for all of Indi what's now present-day Indonesia. And then uh, later, um, in 1963, the northern province, the northern states of Borneo became independent, as became separate from England and became part of Malaysia. So, um, population is 19.8 million people. Um, two thirds of them live in the Indonesian part. One third live in, in these parts. Uh, more recent, it's mostly Dayak ethnic groups. Uh, most of the coastal Dayaks were converted to um, Muslim in the 16th, 15th and 16th century uh, through traders from, from uh, India and, and further west. Uh, Kalimantan is this part of Indonesia is now uh, the place where high populations from Jakarta and other places in Indonesia are being resettled into this, so it's a big transmigration area and, and the populations of these are growing quite rapidly. Most of the economy t depends on agriculture, logging, mining, oil, oil and gas. Brunei is, remains independent because it's got large oil and gas reserves. Um, and uh, now developing ecotourism, and that's what I'm gonna talk about is some of that uh, development now. But, um, let me give you a little bit about biogeography here and why it's uh, such an important 
um, place for tropical forests in the world. Um, the tropical forest estimated to be over 140 million years old. Um, during the Pleistocene, when the ocean levels were much lower, Borneo was actually part of the mainland. It, it lies on a part called the Sunda Shelf. Um, and so uh, it, it, it freely exchanged animals and populations with the mainland during that long period of time. Um, that w was only became an island after the retreat of the last uh, ice sheets. It contains 1% of the world's land mass, but contains 6% of the world's species of plants and animals. It has over 15,000 flowering plants, uh, 3,000 species of trees. If you think of 3,000 species of trees, the Great Smoky Mountains has 200 species of trees or woody plants. So this is really quite something else. Uh, it's home to over 200 mammals, some of which are only found in Borneo, 688 species of birds. North America has about half that. Um, and uh, only 50, there's some that are only found in Borneo as well. Now, just to give you a little, since this is a science form, I'll give you a little science here, but basically, um, well-known ecological biogeographical rule called island biogeography. Basically, when an island is close to the mainland, it, it tends to have, so you have increasing species richness, and then here you have, on this axis, the rate or probability of colonization. The closer to the mainland it is, the more likely it's to be colonized by things from the mainland. So during the ice age, it was connected to the mainland, it was mainland, and that's where you have the highest species diversity. As you get further away from the mainland, the species richness declines with distance from the mainland. So the probability um, uh, goes down. Now, uh, you also have the, the number of species on an island is balanced by how often a species arrives there and how often it goes extinct locally. So the probability of the extinction is fairly high on small islands and low on large islands. So here we have a case where it's close to the mainland and it's a large island, so it's way out here on the species richness, large number of species on that island. So that's what makes Borneo a really unique place in the world. Now the climate of Borneo is fairly boring. Um, it, it rains all the time. The temperature remains in the 80s and 90s cooling off to the low 80s at night and rising to the 90s during the day. Relative humidity is about 85, 90% all year round. A dry month is one where there's only 10 wet days during the month. A wet month is when there's 20 wet days during the month. And you can see there's some dry months, but pretty much, it's pretty much the same all year round. So this is what leads to essentially tropical rainforest um, being the dominant vegetation type on here. Now I'll tell you a little bit about the excursion that we had. Um, we mainly stayed in the province of Sabah, the northeastern part. There's a mountain range here and the highest mountain in Southeast Asia is right here. It's over 14,000, Mount Kinabalu, it's over 14,000 feet high. So there's a diversity of habitat types associated with the, the the topographic relief across this island. The main ridge of mountains is along here, the Crocker Range. Um, we flew into uh, Kota Kinabalu, which is right here, and then flew to Sandakan where we started our, our trip. We traveled from Sandakan up the Kinatabagan River uh, stayed there for a while, then we went to the Tabin Nature Reserve over here, stayed there for a few days, and then we spent the rest of the time in this large nature reserve over here, Danum Valley, which is a really spectacular place. And then flew back and then spent uh, a couple of days at Mount Kinabalu. So, we'll give you a rough idea then of where we went. So, in 
um, Sandican, we went to visit two um, wildlife centers, one of which was the Borneo Sun Bear Conservation Center. Bo the Borneo Sun Bear is the, it's the smallest bear in the world. Um, it's endangered, um, and uh, the habitat for it is decreasing. We'll talk about habitat loss later in the talk. But uh, this guy here, um, uh, Charlie Wright, was our tour, tour guide. He's actually Hawaiian, but he went to um, Saba probably 10 years ago as part of an NGO project where he lived in a, a village on, this, on, a, on a river for two or three years. Speaks fluent Malay, and uh, the NGO was trying to find out what could be done for development that was not related to mining, logging, or agriculture, or forestry. Um, and uh, so he essentially developed a, a ecotourism company that now has probably somewhere around 25 or 30 employees, all from Borneo. Um, but, and, but he, being able to speak fluent Malay and knowing all the cultural features and historic features of Borneo um, is doing this. So he was actually, National, National Geographic actually contracts with local companies to run their tours. And so he's, his local company is called Sticky Rice Travel. <laughs> so if you want to avoid the high cost of a National Geographic tour, you want to go to Borneo, call Charlie up, get to his company, <laughs> and he'll do whatever you want to do um, for that. Now this guy here, uh, I have to look up what his name is here. Um, but he's, he, he's an international res internationally known researcher for sun bears, uh, and he established the Sun Bear Conservation Center. Um, he's a, a field researcher. And if, you go st if you're going to be a bear expert, where do you go to college? He's a student of Mike Pelton's <laughs> from UT. Great. And so, Click was not working here. So here's some pictures of sun bears we could get at the reserve here. They're small, they have this little white patch in their chest. Or if they stood up, they'd be about this tall. <coughs> um, and then we went to uh, the Sipalak Orangutan Rehabilitation Center. This is a place that gets orangutan, orang orangutans and uh, brings them that have been orphaned or um, left behind when there was a clear cut or a logging operation or whatever, and uh, um, tries to rehabilitate them and, and release them again. The, uh, I don't know what's happening here. Um, this is a Prevost squirrel that also likes to come down. They have a bright, they have a bright red belly. I'm sorry we didn't get a picture of that on here, but. Uh, then after we toured, we toured these places uh, in Sandakan, we went up the Kinabit. I'm going to say, I'm going to be able to say this before this is over here, <laughs> Kinabit Tangkang River, and so we cruised up in these in these boats to arrive at a National Geographic lodge on the river. Well, it's been there quite a few years. Uh, this again was a, probably a place that was only visited by fairly adventurous people. They have rooms in here named after some of the people who visited here, like Attenborough and um, Leakey and uh, who's the gorilla woman? Jane Goodall. I mean, these are, those are the kind of people that visited this place. But um, mainly it's now a lot of birding tours, um, bird watchers uh, trying to check off more species of birds like to come here. Uh, but they have a boardwalk around the back uh, that you can go around and do a lot of nature observations on. And uh, when you're going up, you see up the river, you see all kinds of ecosystems, including the, the palm swamps, which are what you hear about Indonesian peat swamps. This formation is on rivers like this. Um, so this is what the, the entrance to the lodge looks like. The cabins are pretty nice. This is the view from where you eat. 
our dining table was this is taken sitting in the chair while eating breakfast, um, looking out over the river. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, you know who? And a Nephila species. Um, this is a, a pigtailed macaque. Um, we can see. And so I'm just going to flip through quite a few animal pictures here, uh, to just to give you an idea of the, and of the diversity of, of things and the spectacular wildlife that you get to see. And it, I'm going to go through them fairly fast because it's sort of like the blur you have when you're there and you're just <laughs> doing that. But I also have a lot of slides to go through. So there are uh, seven species of hornbills in Borneo, and this is the Oriental Pied Hornbill. This is the hornbill that's in flight. Now these birds stand about this tall, and they have these big um, protuberances on their bills that, that make them uh, unique. They, they use those to amplify sounds that they make. So hearing them squawk and clatter and stuff is really spectacular. Uh, this is a proboscis monkey. We also went to a proboscis monkey rehab center in, in uh, Sandy Ken as well. There's a, a proboscis mon monkey and it's young. Um, the way we viewed wildlife here was not only on the boardwalk where we could walk around and stuff, and we also got in boats and went up side streams and um, saw wildlife that way as well. So we're busy the whole time. This is a black and red broadbill, uh, a white-bellied sea eagle. Uh, this is a gray-headed fish eagle, a fish-eating eagle. This is a, um, a pair of storm storks. Um, we met a guy at the, at the lodge who had come specifically to see the storm stork, storks from, from Montana. <laughs> and, uh, he, he ended up leaving without seeing it because he wasn't on our boat. He wasn't, he wasn't with us when we saw these, but he saw lots of other birds, so he was pretty happy. We showed him the picture and said, yep, that's it. <laughs> uh, this is an Asian black hornbill. We got to actually see all seven species of hornbills while we were there. You can see that nice protuberance on its, on its head. And this is a, a wreathed hornbill. Has a, it's, has this really orange bill that has it sort of flared out on top. This is a Pacific swallow. This is an interesting animal. This is a. It's a. It's called a kalinga. It's actually a flying lemur. It has a like a flying squirrel. It has skin flaps between its legs. It's hanging out in the daytime, and this is, that's probably about the size the animal actually is. It's a pretty good sized uh, animal, so it's a canopy flyer, and it was just hanging out on the tree on the boardwalk behind the lodge. Nocturnal, uh, basically. Yeah, nocturnal. Mm -hmm. So it's a Kaluga. Um, if you could, there's, a, there's a stack of books here. There's a mammal book in here. If you want to page through there, you can find those things too, and a bird book, and so if you want to pass those around, you can take a look at some of those things. And then here's an orangutan with its baby on its back. This is a, a long-tailed macaque, um, an imperial pigeon, a, a white-crowned hornbill. You can see it's got sort of this things standing up. We went out during the daytime and also at nighttime because you'd see different things at night. This is a, a buffy fish owl, an owl that eats fish. Um, just sitting over the, over the water. It was probably about 10 feet off the water uh, looking down into the, into the river. And this is probably the mo one of the more interesting ones. This is called a tarsier. It's actually a primate. It's about this big and it's Insect. It's an insect eater. 
And uh, this was again on the boardwalk behind the lodge where we were staying. Um, nocturnal, has those big eyes. It can't actually, just like an owl, it can't turn its eyes. It has to turn its head to see. Um, and it's probably the only insectivorous primate, completely in insectivorous primate. After uh, spending a couple days viewing wildlife there, we got, went over, across the, up the river and across to a bus station and got on the buses to go to our next place, which was a, a cave um, not too far away. That's uh, a habitat for uh, swifts that build their nest with saliva on the walls of the cave. And then these nests are harvested to make bird's nest soup. There's three species of swifts. There's the white nest um, swiftlet, the black nest swiftlet, and the moss nest swiftlet. The white nest is the one that's prized for making soup because uh, it doesn't have the other junk in it. <laughs> but uh, they're allowed to harvest at certain times of the year. These are the, the workers that, where the workers live when they're doing the harvesting. You can see some of their equipment laying on the ground there. Um, they come from different countries around the world to, uh, to do this. They have a permit system and all that kind of stuff. So that's an Asian delicacy. Yeah. So this is going into the cave. You can see some of the equipment they use to access the, the nests in here. Um, some more equipment. These are brave people. Uh, and then, then inside the cave, hmm? How big are the nests? Yeah, they're not very big. Did you have any in No, it didn't. It wasn't the right season for it. Um, and this is a boardwalk that goes around the inside of the cave. There's also lots of bats in here. Uh, this is probably, this pile here is probably about 10 meters of, of bat guano. So it had um, a fairly strong smell in here. And, <laughs> And everywhere you went, there were these centipedes and roaches on everything. Uh, the guide said, the boardwalk can be a little slippery. If you fall, you have to walk from here to the next place. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a little shack where they bag up their nests and, and, uh, and keep, their, keep, keep, their, keep, their lunch, keep their lunches. And, Hmm? Those birds aren't endangered, though? No, they're not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think what it is is they're allowed to harvest the first nest that they make, then they rebuild a nest, and then they can't harvest those nests. And, and, uh, that ha and then they can harvest them after they've fledged, but then they're, they're not as valuable because they have to clean the bird poop out of them. <laughs> Uh, so we headed out to the next place, in Long, uh, which was Tabin Wildlife Reserve. Uh, this is a, a monitor lizard we saw on the way. Uh, this is a, a Wallace's hawk eagle. Um, when I was showing you the diagram of, of where Borneo li lay on the Sunda shelf during the Pleistocene, there's a biogeographic line there called Wallace's Line. Wallace was a, an early explorer biologist who traveled a lot in this area. And he noticed that on the islands to one side of that line had fewer species and different species than the ones on the other side of the line. And so in the early 1800s, before he knew about changes in sea levels, he could detect the fact that there was a difference in the biogeography due to this island biogeography <coughs> um, from the differences in animals and plants that occurred on these islands. And that was called Wallace's Line. Now, Wallace wrote a letter to Charles Darwin at the time saying that he believed that some of these differences was due to the fact that the species evolved. And Darwin hadn't published his book yet at this time. So Darwin contacted him, got, got back with him, and they read their papers together at the Royal Academy of Sciences. So it's actually Darwin and Wallace that uh, um, are attributed with the uh, theory of evolution by natural selection. And part of that story comes from here, and this eagle, is, hawk eagle, is named after Wallace. 
and a lot of other things named after Wallace there as well. But that was one that we saw. Now this is the lodge at Tavern, um, and this is the, the dining area where we ate. One thing you'll notice is that all the places I'll show you, there's no screens, no windows, nothing. Insects were not a problem uh, during our whole, our whole time. <laughs> a lot of birds eat them. Yeah. So, and then um, there, we stayed in these cabins, which were along a river, connected by a boardwalk um, to the dining area. Um, and then one of the features of this place was we went for, you know, called game drives. When I first heard game drives, I thought we were going to sort of herd all the games. <laughs> and but it basically, you got on a vehicle and you drove. And, and looked at game, and these were open, open on the top, and you sat on these benches, and you just had binoculars, and they'd wait for the sun to set, and then they'd shine lights and look for glowing eyes, and then find the animals to look at. And so some of the things we looked at, well, so this is the entrance to Tavern. Uh, you can see uh, various symbols of the kinds of things that you see here, elephants, wild boar, wild boar, and and, uh, and other things, um, leopards. And Did you see any elephants? Um, barely. I'll, I'll show you our shot. Our shot. <laughs> These guys, um, I think, are um, well. They're they had a job, and they're they're sort of, they're sort of like this bus station, and they had this little motorcycle, and their job was to go up this road that went between the nature reserve and the oil palm plantations that were next to it and keep the elephants from crossing over from the reserve into the palm plantations. And so they had all along that, that road, there was an electric fence on one side and they'd put out smudge pots at night because apparently the elephants don't like the smell. Um, and then they'd patrol, they'd patrol it. So their job was to patrol this during the night to keep the elephants out. So while we're sitting there waiting, we saw this critter here climbing up this tree. And Charlie knew what it was, so he just got everybody to get their telephotos out and get ready for it. And then it climbed up a little bit higher. And then it, then it flew. So this is a giant red flying squirrel. And that's probably about this big around. Big around. It's a big squirrel. Other things we'd see, this is a moon rat um, we, we caught a glimpse of. There was just this bird, this uh, yellow-bellied prinia that was just roosting for the night in some grass along the side of the road. This is a, a Malay civet, which is a kind of a cat. Um, it was just out hunting and we spotted it on these rocks. A sandball deer. Uh, and what happened here? Oh, come on. Oh, this is my favorite animal. Well, it's a, it's a picture of a slow loris. <laughs> but uh, somehow it's blanking out on it here. A slow loris is a, a um, you'll see it in here, it's, it's a, in the, in the book, but it's, um, it's actually a, a venomous animal, um, a venomous mammal. There's, it, uh, what it does is it has a brachial glands, what we call armpits, that secrete um, some venom. And what they do is they, they lick it and mix it with saliva, and then they can use that to uh, uh, keep predators away. They actually they actually comb, they can comb, use their teeth to comb this into the hair of their offspring to make them smell so that they won't they'll be protected to some degree by predators. The only other venomous mammal is the platypus, I guess. Yeah. Uh, um, so I don't know why, why, the, why its picture isn't showing up. I can see the picture in the thumbnail here, but I can't see it on the screen. Then there are also other things at night, tree frogs and spiders. There's a huntsman spider 
and uh, various kinds of lizards. Um, and uh, at, uh, at Tabin, there was a, this was also a wildlife research station. And uh, this is a, one thing they had here was uh, the Sumatran rhino. Um, the last three that are known to be in the wild in Borneo are at this place. Um, so we got a special tour of this place because Charlie knew the, the guy. And one, the guy who wrote the mammal book, um, Uh, and the other guy. <coughs> yeah, it's, he's, he's, it's John Payne, but uh -huh. when he, he married an Indonesian woman that was Muslim, and he adopted a Muslim name uh -huh. so as his first name. But John Payne um, is the director. That's him standing right there, John Payne. And uh, he, uh, he let us come in and see the, some, the, some, one of the Sumatran rhinos. Now this is a, a, a two-horned rhino, has two horns. There's, there's, there's a, they have three here. There's probably two or three others still living in the wild in, in Borneo. All the rest are in zoos. And uh, so basically uh, all the females here have ovarian cysts so they can't reproduce. Um, and uh, one of them has died since we've been there. But uh, so this is a, a species that's, well, not only a species, it's a different genus than the African rhinos. What was the original population? Hmm? What was the original population? Uh, probably on the order of well. tens of thousands. So, so what's the relationship between the African one and this when they're thousands of miles of miles? Yeah, they're from the days of the land bridge, right? Yeah, they're from the land bridge a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's some still on Sumatra as well, but that's the only places where they're, they're alive. Is there some reason for the, for the disappearance of uh, Habitat destruction and hunting. Okay. Um, again, their horns are valuable, um, and uh, so they're hunted just for these small parts. Uh, then we went. Uh, from there to a place called the Mud Volcano. It was not actually a volcano, it's a geologic feature where the water accumulates and then it bubbles up and creates this wetland kind of, that has all these minerals and so it becomes like a salt lick or a mineral lick for all kinds of animals and it's a good place to go to see them. This is sort of on the trail up there, you can see it's, this one's pretty muddy. Uh, you go by these great big trees with these big buttress buttresses on them. And the mud volcano looks like this, and you see lots of, we saw lots of signs of cats and, you know, footprints of cats. This is elephant dung. Um, that's there. And at this <coughs> lodge, they give you these boots to wear on the, on the trail, and you come back here and, and, and hang your, and wash your boots off and, yeah. and so. But um, given the high humidity here, I talked about, not insects, but this is a, a terrestrial leech, and so they live in the vegetation and they can sense gradients of temperature and CO2, and if you stand still long enough, you can see them sort of like inchworms coming towards you. Um, and they, they do get on you, but and you, you don't really notice them until you see blood dripping. Yeah. But, uh, but this is what they look like when they're or they're attached to you when they get engorged. Um, this was one of the guides. Um, one of the things that they, they gave us right when we started were these um, leech socks. And they, what it is is most socks don't have a high enough density of fiber to keep these leeches out. So you basically you put these on over your socks and over your pants and then put your shoes on in them. And these have a, a high enough density that the leeches don't get through. Room. So you can get at least not have leeches between your toes that have slid down between your boots when you when you do that. Uh, here's a, a rufous back kingfisher. Um, a Bornean gibbon, 
these are very acrobatic. We got up early in the morning and watched the troop of these swing through the trees, right through the tavern, right through the cab by the cabins where we were staying. Very acrobatic. Here's a, uh, a walking stick of some kind that just came in to have breakfast with us. And uh, this is a, we left, then left Tavern and went to um, Danham Valley in the, on the 70 kilometer sort of forest service road that we had to do to get into the, the tourist play, the tourist lodge. Um, we saw this orangutan. It's a, you can tell it's a big male because the males develop these big skin flaps on their face. Um, you can see elephant dung along the road here, and uh, what happened was an, a small group of elephants crossed the road really quickly, and so the, uh, Charlie got out of the van to snap a picture, and he had his telephoto lens on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the only picture we could get before they all disappeared into the forest. <laughs> but it turned out to be an interesting picture. So here's the... Uh, the Denham Lodge, the road that goes into it. Uh, and this is what it looks like from a, a nearby ridge that we climbed up. This is the main dining hall where we eat. These are the cabins that we stayed in. Uh, there's some more cabins over here in the woods. And there's a bend of the Denham River that goes <coughs> around here. And then this is the um, place where the staff live. It's, it, you can imagine, it's 70 kilometers down the gravel road. It took us four hours to get in there. So it's really isolated. Um, and uh, so the, the permanent staff actually live on site here. <coughs> this is what the dining facility there looked like. You can see we didn't, I mean, I think what they're trying to do is develop this as a place where it develops quite a bit of income for the locals and, and for the country as well. This is where we ate our meals. You can see, no, again, no screens or anything around here. We'd sit here and we'd watch birds fly into these trees and scavenge insects and whatever <coughs> off of those things. Um, this is a, uh, a blue-throated bee-eater. There, there was just flocks of them flying over this field. We're sitting on the porch of the lodge, we're you know, of the cabin we're staying in, looking out over this field. A little bit later on, a, a bearded pig came by. And then we could hear something rustling in the trees next to us, and all of a sudden, a big chunk of bark would fall on the ground. And so we looked around, and all of a sudden, we saw this. You can see that's a, an arm of an orangutan. It was just, I mean, you can see we're on, sitting on the porch of our lodge here. And what he was doing was peeling off the bark and then scraping the bark with his teeth. And you can see his teeth marks on the, you know, scraping the cambium out of the bark uh, to eat. And this, um, so you can see when you look at him, he's all sticky from, this, from doing this. You can see him eating a, eating a piece. Look, look at all the, all the sap he has around his mouth. But um, there was a researcher there studying orangutans. He had 11 orangutans that he was following in that, uh, that vicinity. And we'd see him out there with his chair making observations and stuff, and we'd look up and see what orangutans he was looking at. This one had a name, um, Son was its name, it was well known. This is the network of trails. This is the lodge here itself, and there's a, a network of trails that uh, were cleared for people to hike. And you always had to go with a guide. Um, because they were afraid of you, mainly elephants, running into elephants. Um, but uh, they wanted to make sure that you were responsible and stuff like that. But there was always a guide available. We'd just go down to the place where the boots were and say, I want to go for a walk, and a guide would show up, and you'd go out, and they'd do whatever you wanted to do, you'd photograph or bird watch, whatever. And they're all mostly college age people, and they're extremely knowledgeable, I mean, good naturalists. What nationality are they? They're all Borneo, Malaysian. They're all Malaysians, you know, um, from Sabah. And uh, since, since Sabah and Kalimantan were 
English colonies, all these people spoke English. They learned English in school. Um, we had a, another guy, his name was Dean. He, he grew up not too far from, from here. And his mother was an English teacher at school. And he spoke impeccable English, even though he was. Did you go tubing? Hmm? Did you go tubing? Uh, no, we didn't go tubing. Some people did. So here we are in the forest. Um, you can see the size of these trees and what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, here's our guide, Charlie, and me, and a couple of the other people that were on the, on the trip. This is actually a, a strangling fig. The figs play an important role in the forest here. There's over 300 species of figs, and there's always a fig blooming or fruiting somewhere in the forest, and figs are an important food source for all the animals here. Um, <coughs> The dominant tree here is called diptocarps, and these are the seeds from the diptocarp. So this is what's called a diptocarp forest. There's 300 species of diptocarps. It's sort of like oaks are here. You know, there's just lots of species, and they do hybridize a little bit, but these are the seeds. Diptocarp means two seed pockets, basically. So dip for two and carp for seeds. So. That's the shape, of the shape of the seeds. And the trees get to be a good size, and some of the vines climbing up the trees get to be good sizes too. Um, but what was really interesting is they had a canopy here, a canopy walk, where you go up and actually walk through the canopy. You're about 150 feet off the ground uh, once you got up there in the canopy. And this is what it looks like. We're used to forests having an understory and then a canopy. Well, these not only have an understory and a canopy, but they have these large emergent trees which form yet another canopy over it. And these get to be 300 feet, 350 feet high. And they stick out over the canopy. So you can see what, what a, a magical place this is. You can be walking through the canopy with another canopy above you and another canopy below you. And so this is what it looks like looking down from that skywalk where you you see that other canopy, and you're up in, the, in among the emergent trees. What latitude is it? It's three degrees north. <clears throat> so there's a, we went out there early in the morning, watched the sunrise, caught the things. Here's some um, ants carrying eggs and food up the tree. Later on in the day, we went back there. They're going down. <laughs> um, I don't know exactly what they're doing. Um, these are. We, in the U.S., they'd be called army ants, but they're, um, they have another name there. Another thing about getting up early in the morning and going out is um, this is a, an orangutan nest. Every night they go up in the canopy and they break off branches and they make a little nest that they sleep in during the night. And then orangutans don't form troops; they're solitary. They go around by themselves. Um, the, the, fem the only times you see Another one together is a, uh, a young one with its mother. Uh, so here's, here's its bed and here it's getting up. And then um, zoomed in a little bit closer, you can see, see this thing. And then you can see that she actually had a, a young with her in this nest. So we got to see that waking up in the morning. This is another animal called a bear cat. It's actually a more related to cats than it is to bears. It's actually a cat. Up in a fig tree, um, looking for things to come in to eat figs that it can eat them. And then something special really happened. Um, while we were out hiking on the trail, all of a sudden the, the rate on their walkie-talkies, I started chattering on the walkie-talkies, and, and our guide said, um, something special has happened. I'm going to take off, and uh, the other Guide's going to show you how to get there, but I'm going to get there and check it out. Someone saw a clouded leopard dragging a red leaf langur, which is a monkey, a good sized monkey, across the trail and was going to eat it. And so they were going to check out to see if they could find it. And they found it up in a tree eating this, um, this monkey. And so there's the clouded leopard. Uh, it's a cat. It's bigger than a bobcat, smaller than a mountain lion, uh, up in the tree. And this is just a telephoto lens, so you can tell how close we were to this. Um, and there's, there's 
parts of the monkey that it was eating. It was just taking a break. Oh, uh, let me, uh, I don't know, how am I doing on time? I'm really running late, aren't I? Well, I'll, I'll skip the movie. If people want to stay around afterwards and see the movie of, of this, um, the guy really got so excited. He went out there, Charlie went out there and spent like 10 hours filming. Oh my God. Um, and got to see the, the slant, this cloud leopard eat almost the entire langur. I mean, all the pieces, there's almost nothing left um, after, after about 24 hours. So other animals we saw, this is actually a, we could hear cicadas all the time during the day and Katie dids at night. Um, the forest was always noisy. This is a, a cicada burrow where they emerged out of the soil. Um, um, a millipede there. These are some species of termite, I don't know. Another good sized millipede here. Um, this is a stingless bee nest. They build these mud tunnels on the sides of trees and, and have long, these long tubes that go down to the nest cavity. And this is a, a roly-poly bug, basically, a millipede. Um, this is a, a burial site, a Dayak burial site that's been estimated to be about 400 years old um, from a, a chief. They can tell it's a chief because you can see all his tools inside the box, inside the coffin, his blowgun and, and, uh, and stone axe and stuff. And this is the other guy, Dean, who grew up near, nearby there um, and uh, spoke very good English. This is my son here who was also on the trip. But uh, Dean's wife's grandfather was Dayak headhunter. So headhunting was um, prevalent until it was pretty much banished by the English during colonization periods. Um, but uh, yeah. So, and then after we left Dan and we went to Mount Kinabalu, this is a, a view of Mount Kinabalu while we're driving up. It's the tallest. Uh, I'm not in the right mode here, I guess, since I got out of the uh, tallest mountain in, in Southeast Asia. Um, a lot of people go there just to climb this mountain. Is it a volcano? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And this is some of the <coughs> villages. Hmm? 13,400 feet. Uh, this is some of the scenery you see on the way up. You can see these villages nestled in the mountain and agriculture all over on these steep slopes. Yeah, Mostly rice, upland rice. Scrubbing. Yeah, that's some uh, probably res plant residue burning from, from rice fields. Um, and that <coughs> mountain in the Badaloo, there was a, a botanical garden. Uh, if you ever wondered where begonias come from, they come from, from Southeast Asia. Um, this is uh, interesting. This is a kind of pitcher plant uh, that forms from the leaf tips of uh, vines that are growing in the trees. It's called uh, Nepenthes, is the genus of these pitcher plants, um, which are only found in Borneo, basically. There's another pitcher plant up close. Um, that's a, like an almost chipmunk sized squirrel. Um, there's lots of species of squirrels. And then if you want to climb to the summit, you have to get a guide who will take you up. It's about a two-day trip to the summit, even, even from fairly high up, um, to go up there. And this is one happy person who'd come back from the trek. Um, but uh, you just, without a guide, you can't go past that gate there. And that's largely just to regulate the number of people that are going to be on the mountain at one time. What nationality? Hmm? What nationality were the visitors? Uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of Japanese and Chinese, um, but it's also popular among New Zealanders, Australians, Americans, because it's an English-speaking country. But I mean, it's Malaysian, but a lot of people speak English. A lot of the signage is in English, so it's easy to get around. Um, but we met also Europeans uh, as well. So, 
We stayed at a lodge on the mountain. Um, this was one view out one window of our lodge. That's the top of Mount Kinabalu, so we were up pretty high. And out the other window, we saw these agricultural fields over here. And there we are, some Filipinos um, that are harvesting vegetables for market at this, at this place. So back at Kota Kinabalu, this is a, the, the capital city of Sabah. You can see it's becoming modernized with lots of development, a lot of Chinese investment here, building malls and shopping centers and things like that in this area, in these high rises. But this comes at a cost um, to this. And I'm going to spend a couple minutes here on what this cost is. <laughs> and basically, the development has largely been from the forest resources that are here. When I studied ecology in college and studied the tropical ecology literature of Richards and um, all the other, the French explorers, this is the, what the forest cover was back then. It was basically unbroken tropical rainforest. This is what has been converted since 1970 to present. Um, half the world's supply of wood now comes from Borneo. And mainly what the main part of this, some, you can see there are some areas that weren't forest. There were grasslands, some native grasslands here as well. But uh, so when it's, it's harvested, the residues are burned, and then it's converted to oil palm plantations. So oil palm plantations, when you're not in these reserves, stretch as far as the eye can see. Anybody who wants to plant an oil palm gets free oil palm seedlings from the government. Um, and you can see the network of roads uh, uh, to support this is quite extensive. Um, the oil palm is harvested in a way that's labor intensive. It's a tree that's been introduced from Africa that is very productive. You get tons and tons of these nuts that have a high oil content. And oil palm is lots of foodstuffs that you and I eat um, and use for lubricants. and. <laughs> medicines and all that kind of stuff. So there's all kinds of uses for this. Um, but basically, people walk down these things and use poles and cut off these big pods that are filled with these oil nuts and then load them into trucks that are hauled, hauled away. And, uh, here's a, a young oil palm plantation. Um, you can r remember back to those <coughs> emergent trees and the orangutans coming out of the nest. That was what this was once. Here's a, a medium-sized one. They mature in about 10 years. and get to be something that looks like about this in about 15 years. Mm -hmm. And these are producing these pods. And there's a pod laying, one of those pods laying on the ground. Yeah, it's a, a monoculture um, that once contained hundreds of species of trees on a hectare of land. And these are the pods at a, a, a facility where they're being um, processed. So, so I'm just going to leave with, uh, we went to a place where we watched the sunrise. Right behind me I'm standing in front of a, a world meteorological air sampling station on a tower that's 300 feet tall. And so I'm on a platform in this tower looking out over the forest watching the sunrise. Um, and this tower is related to the kinds of work I used to do at the lab where they're mm -hmm. measuring CO2 concentrations and methane concentrations of the atmosphere and, and, and doing that. But I'm looking out, watching the sunrise over what the forest wa largely was over most of Borneo. And that's what it looks like now. So I'll just leave you with that thought and take any questions. I know it's kind of late here. But We have time for a couple of questions, and then uh, for those who can stay a little longer and ask more questions and see the movie, um, maybe Dr. Post could stay for that. Yeah. Back all I hear and read uh, are doom and gloom for Borneo. Are you seeing, uh, is the ecotourism taking root? Is it, is it going to turn the corner? Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think it, it will. And, you know, people like Charlie. Uh, Ryan, Char Charles Ryan is his name, uh, are pioneers in this, and I think it, they're doing, doing the best they can. And I think 
Saba, at least, has probably turned the corner on this. I don't know about the rest of Indonesia. In Indonesia has huge population problems. But uh, Saba and Malaysia probably are starting to turn the corner on this. And um, hopefully uh, uh, this alternative industry will, will help. I, I think what we're going to do is we'll end up with nature reserves in an island, you know, which are islands in a matrix of agricultural and forestry, forestry operations. But um, one of the things that was being done at Denham was uh, research on what they called sustainable forestry. Uh, how do you do forestry in here and maintain the tree diversity that, that was there? And so that was one of the things that they're, they're beginning to work on. Yeah. Are the various governments willing to work together on uh, keeping the forest intact? <clears throat> um, I don't know. I kind of doubt it. But, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned about the, uh, the headhunters and so on in the middle of the island. <coughs> uh, mm -hmm. My cousin was with the Australian troops that landed at Felix Parpana. Uh -huh. The story was that those Japanese troops had nowhere to go, went a trek due north, right through the middle of that. Uh -huh. and the story is that not as many were there when they arrived in the north as it's left. And I gather <laughs> that the, uh, how they diet, they were, not only did they have an opportunity to do this and were for doing it. I think they were also rewarded, which was the very yes. opposite to the law before. Yes, the, the Dayaks were very badly treated by the Japanese. Okay. And so any opportunity they had, they banded together and formed militias and went after them. And so it doesn't surprise me that, that uh, they had the, the Japanese I'm had a rough time. Better, well, one more question. Okay, so if you were to tell someone who's never really heard of Borneo or knows nothing about it, why should people be interested in helping save it? Well, um, as I said in the earliest part, 6% of the world's plants and animals live on Borneo. Um, and that means that right now they're disappearing. I mean, it's sort of, sort of like another extinction wave due to uh, mankind's development and a lot of those species that we saw in these pictures today will be gone in the next 20 to 30 years unless um, something is done to turn that around. So um, having intact forest ecosystems um, is the, the only way that we have to, to make that happen. Let's thank Dr. Post once again.